This is the man from Modesto. I want to talk about this notion of given enough time, anything could happen. So here's how you usually see this argument. And it goes like this. Well, uh, sure, you know, I've observed that, um, you know, uh, the bill of a particular bird changes in length. You know, sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter, you know, and this and that. And given enough time, the fact that I can see a small change, I can then extrapolate that those changes then add up to, to move one species into another species and can convert rock into micelles, into amoeba, into fish, into salamanders, into land mammals, and into human beings, you know, eventually. That this is gonna happen, you know, given enough time. So that's their argument that uh, macroevolution could happen. Now, the real problem with evolution is that uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a shell game with the use of the word uh, evolution. They use, it, they use one word simultaneously to mean two very different things. Uh, and then they prove one and then fallaciously assert that the proving of one definition, which should have, they should have separate words, but they don't, that the proving of one therefore proves the second. And those words should be macroevolution, the conversion of a fish into a dog, uh, and microevolution, the simple observation that everyone can make right now, if you walk down the street and look at a family, you will know the children don't look like the parents. They're different. If you do the same thing with birds on an island, hey, the, the, the birds on the island are slightly different in size and you know, physical specifications than the birds on the mainland. Why? They have different soil type, different supply of water, different types of food to eat. So, They'll, they will physically adapt over generations. Some will have you know, superior fitness and they will survive. However, the created type is preserved. The created type continues. The bird continues to be a bird. There was only one pair of breeding dogs on the ark, but they have subspeciated into, I think the claim is now 150,000 different types of dogs, but they are all dogs. So. Macroevolution exists in order to create the create it to preserve the created type and to allow animals to radiate. That's God's design. I want you to cover the earth. I want you to reproduce and cover the earth. So of course he designed into us the ability to adapt and survive in new climes, in new environments, different weather conditions, different geographical conditions. He had designed us to adapt. There's no mystery there. Anyone can observe it. No one doubts macroevolution. When you try to prove evolution and point out an obvious fact that everyone knows about and pretend like you're presenting something interesting and powerfully convictive, it's really ridiculous. And it shows how poorly you've really thought out the power of that argument. And it shows your disrespect of the person with whom you're conversing on the issue of evolution when you assert a basic observation and then claim that it proves your point that a salamander became an armadillo. This, th that's never been observed, it's never been proven. So when the evolution gets backed into this corner, challenge, he says, well, given enough time. And here's what given enough time really means. Given enough time means, hey, outside of the boundaries of your observational capacity, what you can see, you don't know what's there. Outside of the time span of what we have personally observed in science and what our scientific forebears, uh, yeah, our scientific forebears, let's say, have recorded and passed down onto us, we don't know what happened there. You know, we have so many 150 years of, of weather data from, you know, the oldest cities, you know, maybe 500 years in a European city somewhere, you know, 47 years of rainfall at the local uh, airport. This is the kind of data that we have, right? And then beyond that, you have to extrapolate. And extrapolation is a risky move in science and it's frowned upon and you have to have a reason that you can claim, well, I believe this will work. You know, there are cases where someone said, well, you know, 100 milligrams of this pharmaceutical product works, 
So the FDA said, well, just approve 200 milligrams. Well, that started killing people because it turns out 200 milligrams is too much. So extrapolation is dangerous. I'm just giving an example, you know, why the, you know, philosophically why extrapolation doesn't work. So we have a very limited range of data. So now if you want to try to apply it to 6,000 years, you're taking a risk because you don't know what the weather was like 4,500 years ago. You don't know what the atmosphere was like 4,500 years ago. 500 years ago, and you certainly don't know what it was like, you know, 200 million years ago. You have no clue. You have no idea how many times the, the Earth's been turned over and tilled by geographic events. You have no idea. You just don't. You have all these guesses, things that people told you, but what have you observed? If you want to be a great scientist, if you want to be effective, if you want to be iconoclastic in your field, you need to use your own noodle, your own noggin, what God gave you, and assess what you have personally observed. Given enough time is a kind of a yo mama response. It's when you're back into a corner and you're losing the battle of wits and the other guy throws down a really clever insult, you know, the crowd laughs and you know, the about to be defeated guy believes that he turns the tables by just saying yo mama, yo mama. And then no matter what is said, he just says yo mama. That's what given enough time. It, it's it's an, an admission of defeat that you have no idea what's going on. You're just saying, well, you know, a long time ago, you don't know what happened and neither do I, and therefore I'm correct because I assert, you know, I aggressively assert that my position is correct. Therefore, I'm correct because given enough time, you don't know. And therefore, my theory, given enough time is... Uh, ridiculous. So I'm going to give you an example of why you should believe in God given enough time. Let's suppose that our cosmos, our universe, is not the first one. There are lots of theories proposing such. Instead, there have been approximately uh, an Avogadro's number's worth to the first exponent of an Avogadro's number, and then anchored onto that one, another exponent an Avogadro's number's worth of Avogadro's number. So it's like Avogadro's number to the Avogadro's worth of powers. That many times there have been, you know, whole cosmoses created and destroyed, created and destroyed, created, and within that one, another one was created and displaced the first one, and then it was destroyed, you know, it faded to dust or something because of, you know, entropy, given enough time. So given enough time, all of that has gone on. In one of these, somewhere, I don't know exactly where, let's just say in the middle, just for, you know, just for entertainment value, let's say or somewhere in the middle, there was a species that developed. It had like 12 arms and three heads and some other things. But one of these, they were so long lived, this particular one lasted for so long that one of these achieved sustainable sentience beyond his physical form. You know, given enough time, it could happen. Yeah, starting to figure it out. So given enough time, somewhere in the middle of all these, you know, huge number, unlimited, virtually nearly unlimited number of cosmoses, some really big number, somewhere in the middle of there, you know, I don't know when exactly, you know, uh, a sentient being emerges. He survives the collapse of the cosmos in which he was originally created. When the next one forms, he's still around. The next physical cosmos forms, he is still in existence. He observes the whole thing, how it forms, how it goes about. And he begins to learn that by his words, that by his thoughts, he can influence the creation of, the, of this cosmos. As the cosmoses emerge and collapse, emerge and collapse, he begins to decide, well, you know, it would be interesting if I were to format how this unfolds. And so he begins to become an artist in the creation of these new cosmoses. Eventually, he becomes the master of the craft. No other sentient being has emerged. Perhaps one started to, and he's like, eh, I'm not interested in the company, and he just quashed it. Who knows, right? Given enough time, it can happen. But so far, just in we, where we particularly exist, another sentient being has not yet emerged. There's only God. He exists, you know, in three parts at least, and we know them as, you know, God Almighty, uh, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You know, given enough time, it could happen, you know, this sentient being has existed and he's also able to, uh, you know, if you gave the analogy, he's a mountain, cut off a rock, and that stone is called 
was he made actually into a, a living being because he could do that he figured out how to do that because he had enough time to learn how you know it's possible listen you're gonna say listen let me say this to you something spiritual that you don't understand you know something physical that you don't understand it could be just a spiritual thing that you haven't yet you know learned about it could just be a spiritual rule you haven't learned about so you know God is able to do all of these things how exactly I personally don't know but you know given enough time this guy could emerge and he could do that so he does all these things and the people come to know him as God they just call him you know Jehovah which is a kind of word that means the God whose name we don't know, the one whose name we don't know, the one who hasn't been named, right? Jehovah. It's not his actual name, it's a name used to refer to him, Jehovah, right? So, that guy exists, given enough time. Given enough time, there could be a super omniscient, omnipotent being, you know, certainly relative to how much power I possess, right? And, you know, known as something, in this particular case, Almighty God. You know, given enough time, it could happen. So, you want to say given enough time evolution, I'm going to tell you how weak that argument is. Because I can tell you, given enough time, God. You don't know how many cosmoses there have been. You were not around to observe it. You do not own a time machine and a super powerful slow-mo camera that you could run while you... Oh, I guess it would have to be a super fast camera that you could operate as you shot through time and observe all of the generations of a particular species as it rose up, you know, father, son, father, son, father, son, you know, all those evolutions, carefully identifying and documenting that, yes, this is the descendant of the predecessor and so on, all the way down through hundreds of millions of generations and show, well, in the beginning, it was a sloth and now it's a giraffe. You don't have the tech to do that. You have not observed that. When you say, given enough time, all you're saying is, nobody's seen it. You don't know. But you also don't know when you say that. You confess, like, I don't know. You know, given enough time, who knows? Given enough time, God. That's the weakness of given enough time. It doesn't prove anything. And you can theoretically, you know, conceptualize anything given enough time. This is a man from Modesto uh, reminding you not to use silly arguments and to just use your own mind to think, like, is this valid? Is what he's saying true? Do I have any personal experience that would support that or that would tend to reject that? And if so, why? Listen, the scientific method, you know, goes problem, observation, hypothesis, experimentation, publication, right? That's not really accurate. It really starts with some kind of an observation. No one develops a problem, which is some kind of a question they want answered, some kind of something they need to overcome, until they have first an experience upon which that question is based. Observation starts everything. You need to look around and see what is really going on and ask yourself, does this make sense? Did the eyeball come around which makes more sense? You know, Occam's razor, which is the simplest explanation? That a creator created organisms or that rocks and water mixed and eventually, given enough time, became you. Does that make sense to you? Or that there's some creator that you also can't explain how he originated, just made everything like it is? Which one makes more sense? Which one seems more probable? This is the man from Modesto reminding the Christians to pray or be defeated. That's a word the Holy Spirit gave me for y'all to close my videos. And uh, to you atheists, as I previously stated, use your mind. Don't trust something that you haven't seen, that you haven't proved experimentally. There's no reason to trust it. It's only a theory, which is another word for a guess or a statement someone has proposed and you don't know the hearts of every man and every person publishing things. And I promise you, there are people out there who are publishing things expressly to deceive you because they do not want you to find out the truth about Jesus and about eternal life. You are following people who are following other people who are following other people whose entire reason for saying what they say is to lead you 
to hell. And you are snared by their thoughts. You are bound up by lies and they're giggling at you. And the same demons that are working to bind your mind up that you can't comprehend it are the same ones that will get the right to torture you in hell. And that's their goal. They want to hold you down. It's a war on for your eternal soul and you are losing. You are a prisoner and you need to be set free. That's from the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants you to know. Because like me, he cares about you. And he does not want you to go into hell. I don't want me or anyone else to go to end up there. And that's why I'm here talking to you.